I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Nathan Barley. He grew up in Yellowstone National Park in the tiny community of Mammoth Hot Springs. His parents have been biologists and park rangers that have lived and worked in the park for three decades. Following in the family footsteps, Nathan studied biology at Montana State University where he earned BS and MS degrees. The ecology of mountain goats in the Absaraka Mountains on Yellowstone's eastern edge was his research topic. Further adventures in wildlife studies took him among moose in Alaska, guanacos in Patagonia, and pine marten in Idaho. His trails have led home as often as afar, where Yellowstone's coyotes, bears, river otters, and gray wolves became primary study subjects. As a contributor to the historic Gray Wolf Restoration Project, he has often been in the field tracking wolves. His research at the University of Alberta focused on the relationship between wolves and elk after wolf reintroduction. With his wife, Linda Thurston, Nathan owns his own wildlife touring business group, the Wild Side LLC, which specializes in outfitting groups to view wolves, other wildlife, and all that the Yellowstone Wilderness has to offer. A defining purpose, if one can be offered for any purpose, person, would be to champion a land ethic that places the highest value on our wildlife and their habitats, and in so doing, forever preserves and enjoy the places that have provided his life's inspiration. So first off, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being in the program. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks. So, um, so tell us about wolves and... Wolves in Yellowstone, and more broadly, the importance of wolves in natural communities. What is the role, or what are some of the roles that wolves play in natural communities? Yeah, wolves are definitely major ecological players. They are top predators in the ecosystems in which they're found, which are mostly in the northern hemisphere, uh, temperate or arctic types of climates. Uh, and in those ecosystems, uh, they prey upon large ungulates, typically. Those are large herbivores that may lead vegetation. And uh, in that manner, uh, they can limit or regulate uh, populations of large herbivores and their subsequent effects on vegetation communities. So through the linkages, you can think of it as the classic food chain, uh, they're at the top, and through their predation uh, and thinning these herds, they actually regulate some of the basic productivity of the ecosystems uh, in a trickle-down type of manner. So the vegetation of communities, for example, uh, can be, in a sense, regulated uh, by wolves uh, through through their predation. So uh, most ecologists would definitely put them in the category of a, of a keystone type of uh, 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 species in a community, uh, or another way of saying it, as, as I started out, they are major ecological players. So let's get let's get specific. Can you talk about um, well talk about the uh, the history of wolves? in Yellowstone, and let's go back to pre-conquest, too. So wolves were in Yellowstone pre-conquest, and then what happened to them, and then and then when did they come back? You bet. So uh, wolves have always been native uh, to the temperate Rocky Mountain ecosystem of which Yellowstone is a part of. Uh, so they were here, uh, presumably for thousands of years, on their own, and with uh, prehistoric humans uh, groups as well. Uh, uh, and when Europeans started to uh, make their way west and, and came to places like Yellowstone and, and discovered its great wonders, mostly at the time thought to be the geysers and uh, scenic landscapes of the park, uh, you know, it was created as a, as a park in 1872. And shortly thereafter, management took over, and part of that management was to protect good animals, animals perceived to be good by human beings, and, uh, by getting rid of the bad animals. And bad animals included wolves and mostly other predators. And so there was a very concerted effort in the late 1800s, early 1900s by park rangers to actually kill wolves. Uh, and they did so systematically, and it was thought by sometime in the mid-1920s, there were no more wolves left in Yellowstone Park or the, or the greater region. 
So wait a second. So when um, I have read accounts um, down by down in Texas of wolf packs, early early European accounts of wolf packs that would be a hundred hundred individuals, um, and that that always seemed incredibly huge to me. So when we talk about wolves, I recognize Texas is different than Yellowstone, but when we talk about there right. being wolves there, were there a lot of wolves, or were there just a few wolves, or do we know? I don't know that we really know that for sure. I, I would think that uh, some modeling efforts by ecologists to look at the community that we do have a good sense was here prior to European colonization of the area was uh, probably much similar to what we have today because Yellowstone, in fact, has been so so well preserved as an ecosystem uh, that probably the number of wolves that we have today is somewhere around 100 maybe 10 packs, average about 10 individuals per pack, is probably what was historically here, at least uh, in that neighborhood. Uh, And so probably not a whole lot more or a whole lot less than what we see today would be, I think, a a good ecological estimate. Okay, great. So we're in 1920, and the wolves have been eradicated. Right, and so the park has gone through many decades without its top predator, and 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 it's good time to say that during that time, some of the biggest controversies of the park in terms of resource management was overpopulation of large herbivores, especially elk, Uh, but more recently, to some degree, uh, bison can be thrown in uh, to that, And, and that's just simply because there wasn't uh, that regulating mechanism in terms of having uh, uh, one of their major top predators, the wolf, present. So uh, back in, I'd probably say the the 1970s when the Endangered Species Act was passed, one of the first species to actually be listed as endangered and needing uh, recovery was the gray wolf, because for the most part in the country, we had wiped them all out. There was only one place in the lower 48 states that we had wild gray wolf populations. I mean, outside of Alaska and Canada, they were in northern Minnesota, and that was pretty much it. So nowhere in the Rocky Mountains, not in Yellowstone or any of these national parks. Uh, And so with the Endangered Species Act, that compelled the government to create a recovery plan and find out some places where wolf recovery was feasible, where we might still be able to do that. Yellowstone was identified as one of the the best choices for for bringing wolves back. It had both the natural ecosystem intact as well as quite a bit of public support that was generated in the 70s and 80s. And so by the 90s, with some pretty good uh, what I would call uh, politics in place, uh, so kind of a a favorable administration, uh, that was that work or operation was executed that uh, wolves were captured in Canada and brought down to Yellowstone, released into the park, and those wolves essentially were the ones that have led to a recovered wolf population today. In fact, wolves are no longer on the endangered species list in our area, in our region, because biologically that recovery program was so successful. And so... You talked earlier about how they can regulate the number of of large ungulates, but um, it doesn't end there. So can you say talk about the relationship between wolves and, for example, trout, where one would think that they would have nothing to do with each other, but it ends up they have a profound effect. Yeah, that's that's been some interesting stuff that ecologists have have, have started to. Uh, uh, uncover, in a sense, are these uh, more paradoxical kind of uh, uh, relationships, and uh, and essentially, essentially, you know, trout could be an important part of uh, uh, the ecosystem in terms of something that uh, terrestrial predators uh, like bears eat, uh, and they were and grizzly bears were eating a lot of trout around Yellowstone Lake for a while uh, until those population population of trout crashed uh, due to a number of factors, but uh, also uh, one of those was the exotic introduction of lake trout. And they switched off to 
essentially eating more elk calves with the, with the lack of trout, uh, grizzly bears sort of switched their diet to some degree and competed a little bit more with gray wolves for this resource of elk calves. And then we saw subsequent to that the decline in the elk population, uh, although it's not critically low or anything like that. Uh, we still have a lot of elk on our landscape. Uh, the, the numbers dropped uh, by thousands. Uh, during the early part of the 2000s because of both wolf and grizzly bear predation. So it all kind of started with the trout and uh, went through a series of steps there to get to where we're at now. And then in addition, don't don't the existence, the, 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 the current existence of wolves on the landscape, don't they also tend to push uh, the elk out of the uh, river bottoms and therefore by allow more uh, new trees to spring up, thereby improving habitat for trout, or am I missing the point on that? No, okay, that's uh, also another uh, mechanism that's uh, been uh, widely widely theorized and I think some places realized on the landscape uh, where uh, because of uh, the ability of wolves to limit the number of large herbivores, let's say like elk, uh, in areas where they're particularly vulnerable, and maybe that's around rivers and streams, the elk either are going to be fewer in number there or avoid those areas because of predation risk, or both. And therefore, uh, we get a lot more vegetation that's, uh, that's growing back in those areas, particularly taller shrubs and trees uh, that we haven't seen for many decades in Yellowstone Park, that kind of recovery and therefore the stabilization of the banks of the rivers and streams and the shading of the water, which helps to cool off the water and therefore offer better conditions for trout. So, yeah, that's the mechanism I, th I think you're referring to there. And just, yeah, another way in which uh, uh, the multiple links in the, in the whole food web here in the park has been uh, uh, operated upon by wolves. So I'm going to ask two questions about which, I mean, if we were just sitting chatting on the porch and, and looking over the landscape, this would be an okay question. But as an interviewer, I'm not sure if this is a good question because I don't have any idea of the answer, and maybe you may or may not. So is there a relationship? I'm just throwing this out because I'm interested. Is there a relationship between, somehow, between wolves and beavers? Because I know beavers are another keystone species. And also, is there a relationship, since they end up competing a little bit for some of the same food, but also not, is there a relationship between wolves and grizzly bears? Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's a, you can you can make the case that there uh, are, are possibilities uh, for, for all of those species, for sure. So... Um, so, uh, for example, with the uh, beavers, the, the mechanism we just discussed where there are uh, willow, cottonwood, aspen trees growing back because of uh, the release of competition with elk eating those, uh, that beaver have been more food to, uh, to eat. And, uh, in fact, we have seen the increase in colonies of beavers in some part of the Yellowstone Park, and it's thought to be related to this you know this mechanism where whereby uh, you know, beaver are no longer in, in, in stuck such uh, competition with elk that they have additional food and resources and that that could be related back back to wolves certainly and uh, yeah and one of the things I just love learning about nature is that what this means is because beavers really help habitat for, for example, caddis flies, it ends up, I just love thinking about how everything is connected, that, that wolves and the reintroduction yeah. of wolves ends up perhaps leading to more caddis flies. I mean, that's just pretty cool. Yeah, it, it really is. Yeah, and, and kind of an overall description of that uh, kind of applied over a, a very, very broad uh, thing like an ecosystem is that, that wolves result in uh, more moderate abundance of a greater diversity of species than ecosystems that, that don't have wolves, which is kind of cool. Yeah, there's maybe fewer of certain species, but there are a lot more species in general. 
so what about what about grizzly bears? Do they actually end up significantly competing for food with grizzly bears, or do they sort of coexist in different niches? Well, it, it, that's been an interesting one because I think there's controversy that led up to, well, uh, we have an endangered species already in Yellowstone before we're trying to recover wolves, and that's a grizzly bear. And, and, and they've kind of fought their way out of a very low number back in the 70s uh, to a fairly recovered number uh, at this point in time. Uh, but during that recovery, a lot of experts disagreed with each other on whether wolves are going to help or hurt. The, the bear's chances or, or, or have no effect at all. And I think the dynamic has kind of boiled down to being one of helping grizzlies, and that would be through providing more food. Uh, essentially, wolves are, are, are good predators year-round because they, they attack as a pack and work together, and, uh, and they're specialists at bringing down large animals uh, like elk and, and bison, deer. And in a lot of cases, grizzly bears may not have gotten those animals themselves, but they can sure take away the carcass from a wolf pack. So <laughs> grizzlies, being brutes, uh, can defend a carcass from a wolf pack in many situations and therefore have access to food that they didn't have prior to wolves. So to be clear, a wolf pack brings down an elk and a grizzly bear happens to smell this or hear it or see it or something, and then comes yeah. and takes the elk, which the grizzly bear would perhaps not have been able to catch by him or herself. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, and, and grizzly bears are certainly predators, and, the, and we mentioned uh, uh, taking down elk calves, very young animals, uh, but they generally aren't spending too much time hunting adult elk or adult bison, uh, and these are animals that uh, you know, throughout the fall, winter, and spring that uh, wolves are occasionally taking down for the most part. And so if bears are around, uh, they can they can certainly uh, benefit by by usurping these carcasses. so i'm gonna I'm gonna jump geographically to to New York State. And I have a friend who teaches at Binghamton University, and Binghamton has a small forest. Uh, associated with the university that has been um, hammered. And the reason it's been hammered is because there aren't any wolves in that area. And so there's this explosion of white-tailed deer who basically are killing all the baby trees. And so there's uh, there's no, what's the word, recruitment of, of new trees? Recruitment. Yeah, and, that's it. Exactly. No recruitment. And there's also, they take a lot of the shrubbery, so all of the ground-dwelling birds are, and salamanders, the guy really loves amphibians, and the salamanders and uh, frogs and ground-dwelling birds are just getting completely hammered because, because uh, there's too many deer. So is that, is that a familiar story to you? That really is a familiar story. So, uh, and I think that's essentially what has gone on in a slightly different ecosystem we hear more in the cold dry west uh, in the rocky mountains and in the areas around yellowstone we have essentially had the loss of recruitment of a lot of shrub and tree species uh, that are associated with high biodiversity so things like insects and amphibians may thrive in their presence uh, but in the presence of a super abundance of elk for many decades those communities completely got suppressed and we lost some species that depend on them in a sense. Uh, not that we you know, can't get them back. Uh, uh, they can recover. But yeah, that is a perfect example uh, of a trophic cascade, which is a kind of ecologist bu buzzword for if you remove these species or replace these species at the top of the food chain, then they're going to have cascading effects down to these basic levels of in this case, the vegetation, and also uh, the suite of species that rely on the vegetation. So if, if let's, let's go back to Yellowstone and talk a little bit about um, the current status of the wolves there. You said there's about 100, which you were suggesting that in your understanding is about the right number for this particular 
area. Can you talk about what... Oh, actually, before we go there, um, are the Yellowstone wolves the source of the wolves who have migrated down to Oregon and California, or is that a different set of wolves? I, I think that uh, the recovery here in Yellowstone has contributed to the recovery over vast areas in the West at this point. Uh, so wolves going into Oregon, Washington, California, uh, recolonizing some of these areas, I think are coming from the Rockies and the recovery that we have uh, had here. Uh, Yellowstone was one of the reintroduction sites. A lot of people don't know or maybe didn't even hear that at the same time, wolves were captured in Canada and brought to Idaho as well. The central Idaho wilderness area was a recovery zone for a wolf recovery at the same time uh, Yellowstone was in the mid-90s. And so that was also successful. And so you have uh, these two different reintroduction zones uh, or locations uh, and wolves spreading out from there, as well as some that actually uh, have come south out of Canada. Uh, we have we now really have continuous wolf populations in parts of Montana and Idaho with uh, with the Canadian provinces of British Columbia and Alberta. And a, a year ago or so, a little over a year ago, I interviewed um, Louisa Wilcox, and one of the questions I asked her was how quickly grizzly bears reestablish. And she was saying that grizzly bears are actually pretty slow because the mother will be – basically the females have territory – and a mother, a daughter will set up fairly near the mother. So they may expand, oh, I don't know. I'm making this, this is not what she said. But she said what I said before, and now this is me. That So grizzly bears may expand five miles a year, five miles a generation, ten miles a generation, twenty miles a generation. Not terribly fast, but that doesn't seem to be true for wolves. Right. That is, that, that's, that's a correct uh, comparison, really, that... Uh, uh, for a number of reasons, grizzly bear population here in Yellowstone and northern Montana has been much harder to recover. It's taken more effort uh, uh, and has been slower in terms of the expanding distribution uh, of the population. Wolves are not so much that way because uh, essentially I describe them as being more precocious, uh, willing to travel great distances over the landscape and end up in areas uh, far away from where they were born or where they left their pack. We had, for example, a wolf uh, that was born in Yellowstone uh, end up on the north rim of the Grand Canyon uh, oh where it was shot in a field. Yeah, but that's a long way. So uh, the idea that a wolf could disperse over a distance of, say, 500 miles is, is not terribly unusual. And furthermore, they're not... Uh, uh, resist the, the the boundary areas or barriers uh, they seem to deal really well with like an interstate highway they're able to cross those types of barriers where as we see other species perhaps like a grizzly bear just seemingly unable to do that that kind of a maneuver and get around a reservoir um, so so wolves are made for traveling and again pretty precocious they'll go into areas that that have you know, pretty uh, substantial amount of human presence, roads, uh, developments, that kind of thing. Uh, and sometimes they'll die in those areas, but uh, some will live. And that's the type of individual that will meet up with another one and start a pack in a brand new area. And Oregon, Washington, you know, the West Coast has been a real uh, per, uh, recipient uh, of those kind of wolves leaving the Rockies for the most part. And, why they haven't done as well going south uh, to places like Colorado and Utah, I think, has been a, a kind of a source of debate. Like, that's pretty continuous habitat as well, not that many people, but uh, could be, you know, fairly hostile as well. And uh, Much of Wyoming uh, wolves don't have any more protection than coyotes have. Uh, so, you know, getting through the state of Wyoming is, 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 is definitely uh Possibly, I would say part of that equation of why they haven't haven't done as well colonizing places like Colorado and Utah. So I'm sorry if this is a really stupid question, but so this also implies that that wolves can 
can be okay at crossing big rivers. If they can travel that far, that means at some point wolves have to swim the Columbia, right? I mean, not those particular wolves because they're further south, but generically, I mean, if you've got wolves on in the upper Midwest and then you've got them in the western Midwest, some of those cross the Mississippi. Yeah, I mean, I think that is possible uh, without knowing for sure how they would respond to to, uh, to reaching the banks of such a big uh, waterway like the Mississippi. But uh, um, it's possible, in my my mind at least, that uh, a wolf could could swim a body of water that big to make it to the other side. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Before we get back to Yellowstone and, and sort of into the future, um, what is the relationship also between wolves and coyotes? I've heard that wolves kill coyotes. Is that true? They will, yes. We've actually seen that here in Yellowstone uh, where coyotes are attracted to the carcasses that wolves are eating on. And uh, in between meals, wolves may go lay down and, and go to sleep away from the carcass area. And that gives the coyotes a chance to come in and also benefit from those carcass kind of scavenge and steal from the wolves, uh, which we see fa fairly regularly, uh, actually. But occasionally, uh, the wolves will come back and chase down a coyote and kill it. Uh, so that initially led to the decline in, in the coyote population, uh, at least as it was perceived in a number of areas around us, in, in Yellowstone and Grand Teton Park areas and in some cases uh, some of those coyote packs have also re recovered and, and we certainly still have a healthy coyote population uh, alongside a healthy wolf population in Yellowstone uh, but possibly uh, a lesser density so so fewer coyotes overall so it so it I know that we're now speculating but so it sounds like the wolf popu the wolves the wolves being there, might decrease coyote populations, but they don't. They don't. I'm just. I'm just so fascinated by all the interactions because, of course, coyotes eat mm -hmm. small creatures. So coyotes eat small birds. They eat small right. mice, which I'm presuming right. wolves don't really bother with. Is that true? That's pretty much true. Um, young wolves might 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 show some of the same behavior in terms of trying to catch voles and mice and rodents and that kind of thing. But they're not relying upon them. In fact, they can't just live year-round solely off of small uh, mammals. Uh, wolves do have to attack and kill these larger, much larger uh, animals like elk and deer to survive. So so what this means is that um, perhaps voles or or mice would also applaud the, the presence of wolves um, because this might mean slightly less predation pressure from coyotes. I'm just... I'm just fascinated by all these things that we wouldn't normally think of, but just like it ends up that reintroduction of wolves might lead to more caddis flies, it may also lead to more voles. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, which I, might be able to feed additional carnivores uh, like like hawks and bobcats and that kind of thing. So, uh, so yeah, certainly another ripple effect uh, moving through the whole ecological community. So. Currently, you said there's about 100 wolves in Yellowstone, and are you, do you feel reasonably secure and happy with, um, with that number? I mean, do you do you stay up late at night worrying that the population might crash, or are you, are you comfortable with that population? Very comfortable with it. It, 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 it. I think it's uh, if you look a little closer at some of the demographic data, you see that you know birds. Births, so new puppies, uh, equal death in terms of uh, the individuals, uh, adult or juvenile, that die each year. And so it's a stable population. Uh, the territories uh, kind of overlap in much of the park, and there's no area of Yellowstone or adjacent land that isn't part of a wolf pack territory, essentially. So it's saturated spatially in terms of the area occupied by wolf packs and so I don't lose any sleep at all thinking about the population it's, it's secure the fact that we protect wolves because it's a national park uh, really does guarantee their future for an unforeseeable amount of time 
uh, in our region. It's a great refuge for them because, you know, outside the park they can meet with uh, much more challenging conditions in terms of hunting and trapping, uh, removal because the wolves have killed livestock. So their mortality rate is much higher beyond the park. But inside the park, uh, it's, again, at this pretty well uh, saturated, saturated, stable state uh, where births, births equal death. Uh, and that, to me, is really, really reassuring. And I might just add one more uh, interesting piece to that, that the, the death of wolves inside the park uh, is due to the number one cause is due to other wolves. So wolves are in, in a competitive state with each other, where typically the dynamic is wolf packs fighting other wolf packs for territory, access to prey species, and that occasionally results in the death of an adult wolf. And again, being the, the most common way that a wolf can die in Yellowstone Park, it is a big contributing factor to that stability and that inability of wolf populations to really increase any more in the park. You know, that's really interesting. I, a, first, I had no idea. And second, um, I had no idea that that was the leading cause of mortality there. And second, yeah. um, so there are a lot, of, a lot of black bears where I live, and I see them every day all through the summer. And I've seen a fair amount of conflict between bears, and honestly, most of it is posturing. And, uh -huh. you know, basically yelling at each other and doing the false charges and, and, right. and I've seen some where they end up with some scratches and I've heard about adult males killing babies. So I, I, I know about all that, but I didn't know that wolves actually had, so is a significant, I don't know what question I have. Just tell me more about that, the wolf wolf conflict, I guess. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's really, it's really interesting. And it's not, not just, just Yellowstone. It's basically any place that wolves exist in the whole world where uh, they don't have a higher source of mortality because essentially humans aren't killing them. <laughs> so, uh, so the natural condition, the natural state for wolves uh, is to be top predators, so there's no predator regulating them above them if humans are absent. Uh, and so they regulate themselves, in a sense, through territoriality and through the frequency of these these in, antagonistic uh, or aggressive types of interactions where it's possible that a wolf kills another wolf or two or three or something uh, through these, uh, these conflicts. And that really is the original, if you might say that, uh, original way that wolves regulate their own population. They're self-regulating in an ecological sense. That's what that's what we would describe it as. Is wolf populations can be self-regulating. So uh, when a lot of uh, wolf opponents come out with the idea like, well, well how are we going to manage the wolves? And, and we like to tell them that, well, wolves will manage themselves. We don't need to manage their numbers because they're going to saturate at some level uh, based on this competitive interaction tax fighting other packs for space and, and resources. So uh, it, to me, it's a really fascinating way to look at top predators as like they don't need humans uh, to intervene. Uh, it's certainly I'm not saying in cases where you know, wolves have become a problem for a livestock producer or whatnot that, that we don't intervene, but the idea that, that we need to have fewer wolves or otherwise they would overpopulate isn't really supported by the ecological data. So if you have a pack of 10 wolves, and let's, first off, is that five males, five females probably? And second, how many females have babies every year, and how many babies are born every year? And also, how long would the average wolf live? Right, right. Uh, so uh, think, of, think of a wolf pack as a family unit. It's really easy for us to think about that because that's the way we live too. We live in family units for the most part, where a wolf pack is made up typically, uh, most commonly, as mom and dad and their offspring. And their offspring may stay with them for quite a number of years. They may stay in the pack and grow up within uh, that unit or uh, starting around the age of two or so uh, or later, they can leave the pack in an attempt to, to start
start their own. So large packs, let's just say 10 individuals, most likely will be uh, mom and dad, sometimes maybe one of their brothers or sisters uh, in the group that they get along with as an older adult uh, that's not necessarily one of the breeding members, and all their offspring. So a lot of juveniles in that group of 10, like they could be uh, half of them could be individuals less than the age of uh, two years of age. So uh, that's a typical composition for a wolf pack. And when you think about the life expectancy of a wolf may only be, and this is from Yellowstone data, five or six years. Like if they live to be one, when we could start monitoring them and, and, and counting them towards uh, the data, then they're on average going to be only live to be five or six years old. A really old wolf in Yellowstone Park, would be 10, 10 or 12. I think 12 is our oldest wolf we ever uh, recorded here in the park. And did they probably die? Did they, like, get uh, a 10-year-old wolf? Can you tell that it's really old? I mean, I'm 57, and frankly, it's a lot harder for me to get up off the floor than it was when I was 35. <laughs> and and are, are wolves the same way that if you see a 10- or 12-year-old wolf or 8-year-old wolf, can you say, wow, that's an old wolf because it's kind of hobbling a little bit, or do they still maintain pretty well? They, they maintain pretty well um, uh, in terms of their their physical ability. So a wolf that loses its ability, let's say, to travel, it's in a lot of trouble. Like they, There's not much they can do, and it just kind of goes downhill from there in terms of not being able to make it to the kills or contribute to the pack eating uh, kill. Uh, so they tend to get malnourished and, and disappear if they're seriously injured. Uh, on the other hand, an old wolf is perfectly recognizable uh, by their appearance, their coat. Um, just like you and me, <laughs> Derek, you get more gray hairs the older you get, right? And wolves are the same way. So a wolf that's born jet black will look almost this silvery bluish color uh, with a lot of streaks of gray hair through uh, its whole coat. And so if I've never even seen a pack before and I'm looking them over and finding these individuals, I can be like, oh, that's an old one. Now, that's a senior right there because essentially of the gray hair in its, uh, in its coat. So, uh, And another example of that that's kind of fun is some of our light gray wolves, those beautiful light gray wolves that you see like in pictures of calendars and stuff. Um, they can also turn very light with each year, more and more gray hair added to the point where they turn – this beautiful white color. So we on occasion here in Yellowstone, we've had some white wolves, uh, but they only get that way after about five or six, uh, seven years of age. And it's, it's very distinct. There you know, oh, yeah, that's, that's one of the matriarchs or patriarchs of the pack uh, because of that appearance. So earlier you said, thank you for all that, earlier you said that, um, that Yellowstone is pretty saturated. And what... I recognize that different biomes would be different, thus you'd end up with a wolf pack of 100 in Texas where there were presumably just, you know, a bazillion buffalo at that point or whatever it was they were eating. Right. Um, yeah. But given Yellowstone, what is a saturation density? How many square miles per wolf or how many wolves per square mile or whatever whatever the number is? Yeah, like most of our pack territories in the park are 100 to 200 square miles. It's kind of a small territory. It sounds like a lot, but it's kind of a small territory for a wolf. Up in the Arctic, uh, that same wolf pack might have a territory of 500 square miles, up to 1,000 square miles in some areas where prey is at low density. So they have to travel a lot to encounter the animals that they need to encounter to stay fed. Yeah, we might imagine that back in Texas in the, in the, in the day, there were – a whole lot of bison running around, which are the most formidable prey animal for wolves by far. Like they're just so big and tough, and they don't run away generally. They 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 fight back, and <laughs> so I could see very large wolf packs uh, convening together for the convenience factor, or maybe the safety or the ability factor of actually being able to hunt bison effectively on a regular basis year round. So uh, so. Yeah, it's an interesting thing to hear about a wolf pack that big, but I think it, it, it has everything to do with the, the type of environment that they lived in. 
Uh, here we have much smaller wolf packs. So, you know, they eat a lot of deer and elk and, and occasionally scavenge a bison, or even they might prey upon a, a, a weak bison here in Yellowstone. We're seeing that actually more and more uh, with each year as the bison population grows. Uh, we're seeing the use of, of bison as a, as a, uh, a prey animal more by the wolf population. Uh, but yet our big, biggest wolf packs are still uh, like in the 20s. Uh, our largest wolf pack ever recorded in Yellowstone since the reintroduction was 37. And it didn't really last long before it broke up into smaller groups. So you said, so let's say that a wolf pack is 10, and you said the, the range is what? How, what's the territory? Maybe, maybe 100 to 200 square miles, something okay, like so that. Okay, so if it's 200 square miles and... Ten wolves would be a density of one wolf every twenty square miles. That's that is that's reasonably saturated for Yellowstone. Is that about right? Yeah. And I just quickly did the calculation that Yellowstone, the area itself, is about thirty four hundred square miles. And if there's a hundred wolves scattered around in that area, it would be basically one for every thirty four square okay. miles. So you, know, you just said twenty, thirty. 40, somewhere in that is, is, a, is a realistic range because, of course, it fluctuates a little bit with the numbers and uh, that dynamic. Yeah, that's still that's still not a lot of wolves. I mean, you, you've, if if one is just sort of blundering around in the in the landscape, one's not going to see a wolf that often then. That's right. Yeah. So uh, uh, <laughs> it's really true that uh, they're the, one of the most sought after species to to view by park visitors, but they're also one of the rarest to actually come across on the landscape because there's so few in numbers. And when I talk to my guests in the morning, hey, we're going to go, we're just going to go in this this part of the park, then usually the northern area of the park. Uh, and over the area that we're going to travel, there's really only about 30 wolves living in this area, broken up into into four different groups. Uh, something along that that lines is what I tell them. And then they they start to realize, wow, is this going to be, you know, a needle in the haystack? Uh, and the short answer would be yes. If you have no idea what you're doing, you're just driving around the park, then you have almost no chance of just bumping into a wolf. Uh, but because we have a guide service and we're biologists and we're familiar with the wolf pack in their territories, we can uh, increase the odds of seeing one by quite a bit just, just from our knowledge and skills and ability to, to find the animals. Uh, you know, we see them most days, not every day, but, uh, but we see them most days out. So basically that would be like somebody knowing that I go to the post office on a certain day. So if you want to see me, you go to the post office on that day. I think it's that kind of dynamic, yeah. With wolves, it certainly is like you know where, where their territory is, and within that area, what places do they like to sleep and bed down, and what areas do they generally travel? Have you seen them actually traveling through before? Um, and that's really one of the techniques uh, we use. Is like where were they yesterday? So where might they be today? Uh, they actually move a lot at night, and so you, they – quite often aren't in the same place they were the day before, but sometimes they are, especially if they had a carcass there. So information is super valuable in terms of uh, having a network of people that are watching the wolves and monitoring them on a daily basis. Uh, you can really take a lot more of the guesswork out of the equation. So I've I, I've loved the pictures and the analyses that, that I've seen from you and your organization. Can you talk a little bit about the wild side? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, my wife, Linda, and I started uh, basically like a biological consulting company years and years ago, and, and we called it called it the wild side. And at that time, we were only doing a little bit of, of guiding, mostly for journalists or for like college student groups that were coming into the park and wanting to learn more about the wildlife. But we quickly discovered uh, through a number of experiences that uh, uh, in those early years after the wolf recovery that there's going to be a great interest in just the general park visitor in seeing wolves and grizzly bears and some of these more rare species to find on the landscape. So, so we kind of jumped fully into the ecotourism realm uh, where we operate uh, a guide service year-round uh, with, uh, you know, any visitors that essentially want to hire us. Typically we take out small groups, but we can accommodate some bigger groups of a dozen or more people. Uh, to go go in a safari-style outing 
uh, and see as much wildlife as we can. I mean, we focus on the wolves, as we just talked about. We, we kind of have that niche of knowing their, uh, their travel routes and the compositions of the pack and fun information. But all the wildlife uh, are, are fun to find on any given day. You know, we may, may run into bears or river otters and a lot of the ungulates and spend time with you know, bison and bighorn sheep and bull elk bugling away in the fall. So, uh, so we really enjoy our jobs. And uh, the wolves have basically been the reason that our company, our business, uh, exists. And we call ourselves Yellowstone Wolf Tracker uh, now, even though our, our sort of original company was the wild side. Uh, we're advertising as Yellowstone Wolf Tracker uh, because uh, it kind of uh, states more of what we're specifically doing now. Uh, but our industry, this uh, ecotourism industry, didn't exist 20 years ago before the recovery of wolves and bears in the park. It just wasn't something that park visitors did. Uh, but now it is because of the recovery of these species. You know, one of the things I think is really important, and one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you, is that just what you said about knowing where they may be tomorrow, it it, it always has struck me that how little we know, how little most of us, myself included, actually know about the land where we live. A joke I used to tell is that, that uh, you know, we all, if I say Angelina Jolie, we know who I'm talking about, or if I say the real thing we know what we're talking about or just do it or any of these slogans but how many people can name 10 species of animal oh, oh just this morning i was out throwing out some bird seed for the birds and yeah. a bunch of birds were sit, were coming down to to grab the bird seed and it has a black head <laughs> it's like i don't know <laughs> what the birds are and they're my neighbors Sure. And, they with you all the time. <laughs> and yeah. um, or, or another great example is that bear, black bears love. They they kill a lot of trees. They kill a lot of dug firs. Uh, they strip the bark and 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 eat them. And this makes timber companies really mm. mad. But I don't care about that. The thing I find really interesting <laughs> is that um, I was asking a biologist friend of mine, what is the ecological purpose of bears? doing eating all these dug firs and my friend said that he lives in a dug fir tan oak forest and dug firs reproduce faster they grow faster um they basically have every advantage over the tan oak except that bears love to eat dug fir bark the, oh, the wow. inner bark and so what he said hmm. is that in this case the black bears are regulating and making sure the forest is mixed and my point is that I think it's wonderful that as well as giving people the opportunity to see wolves, you are also implicitly and probably explicitly um, showing the importance of paying attention to wildlife. I mean, that's all it is. It's like, okay, the wolves were here yesterday. They might be here tomorrow. They might be over there tomorrow. And just getting to know them as neighbors, which is what we really have to do if we're going to survive. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? I, I am. I definitely think that's true, uh, and, and there's so much, so much satisfaction and an almost primordial sense that you are back to living on a wild landscape where you know enough about those movements and characteristics and, uh, and and qualities of these animal populations around you that 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 uh, that it's more tangible, you know. And I and I feel I feel like everyone needs that connection to nature. You know, whether they know it or not, or whether it appeals to them initially or not, I feel like once they get out there and start doing it, they're going to like it. You know, they're it's seeing these animals really just makes like that connection for them. So, is we have like a minute left? Is there anything else you want to say about the wolves in Yellowstone, or about connection to nature, or about anything? You bet. You know, I think one of the topics that that maybe we hadn't uh, stumbled upon and, and all the fun things that, that we did talk about uh, was this idea of the ecotourism industry uh, in Yellowstone and in the in, in our region in general. I mean, there's there's three states around the park that uh, are kind of considered gateways economically to to Yellowstone Park, uh, and, and they all have the distinction of having visitor recreation or tourism being one of the top industries of the state, if not the number one industry, the number two. 
uh, is true for, for Montana and Wyoming and Idaho. Uh, you know, and millions of dollars, billions even, uh, in these industries of watchable wildlife. And so as our industry has developed, so too has the political power that goes with that increases to the point where uh, increasingly these states are willing to listen to representatives of an economy that may be more about the future of these places, of these states, uh, than it was in the past. Uh, and so just to kind of be specific about that, we have more ability to protect wolves uh, and grizzly bears, which are controversial species. There's still a lot of people out there that just, you know, hate predators and hate wolves. And, and, uh, and a lot of our politics has have really reflected that in the past. But the future, I see more reflecting the situation, the ecological knowledge we just talked about. It all comes to bear. And some of these situations economically politically i think are going to kind of turn more in the favor of the wolves and the wildlife uh, as time goes on so that's my optimistic vision of the future here well thank you so much for that and and thank you for your work in the world and i would like to thank listeners for listening my guest today has been nathan varley this is derek jensen for resistance radio on the progressive radio network